Scott Kilmartin who calls himself something else and he'll tell us what that is at the minute but in a minute but essentially he's the founder of a business called Hall who recycles rubbish into really funky fabulous streetwear and and products and neat things like laptop covers um, and bean bags and that sort of thing welcome today Scott thanks Fiona what do you call yourself well, I've always been sketchy on titles like founder and director and CEO and general manager. So we had one of those moments where we were about to print some new business cards about uh, I don't know, seven or eight months ago. And um, we had a courier come in to pick up a whole bunch of stuff in pre-Christmas. And he's gone, this place is a circus because there were boxes stacked and everything else. And I've gone, that's it. We're all going to have circus titles. So we have a puppeteer. We have a strong man. Um, we don't have a bearded lady, but I'm the ringmaster. So that's a great title. A little play and getting away from all that stuff. Um, Scott, you started Hall as, as the original company 10 years ago. Um, recycling rubbish back then, what, what a neat idea. What inspired you and how did you get started? What got you into it? Sure, so I, um, I lived overseas for a long time, um, came home, had seen these, I was living in the US at the time and had found these odd guys in Pittsburgh that were um, using old license plates as covers um, for, as, as literally roofs on little birdhouses and I thought, kind of, weird quirky product but cool use of stuff so um, I was looking for some things to do and I brought home a bunch of ideas and thought this would be a kind of a cool creative sideline never thinking it'd be one that would go particularly far with it but ended up harassing transport departments um, all over Australia trying to one get access to plates because it's actually illegal to deface, deface number plates so one get permission to do it two get access to plates and then we started making um, started making I made a photo album for a friend and it was about to go overseas out of a out of a Victorian number plate and you know it was the people that saw it when I gave it to them that it was like one of those wow kind of moments I thought yeah there might be something in this so it really started from quite innocent beginnings. What was your first product? Was was it the number plates? Yeah, so we started making number plates. We initially um, kind of took over my dad's garage and um, and got some little little pressing press machines and riveting things and and we started making photo albums and journals and little CD carriers out of number plates and selling them at a market store at Salamanca Market in Hobart. So you started off um, at the markets. When was it that you actually? got all corporate and got a factory and, and got a store and all. how far into the 10 year journey was that? A fair way because at the time I was doing a few other things so for the first, look we've been going for 10 years but it's a bit of a well, not kind of myth but it really hasn't been the business that, that it's evolved into now for that long it's really only been the last probably four years where it's been um, we rebranded initially I started it was called Urban Boomerang mm -hmm. the kind of urban boomerang meaning coming back recycled which I thought at the time was a great name but ended up being a bit kitsch so mm -hmm. um, what we initially were making things out of number plates it was literally um, we started I went to a trade fair and started wholesaling things in 2001 um, and that still ticked away it was still a come home get some get some orders out of the fax machine and make things on weekends but it was I was still it was still a sideline still doing other things 2003 decided that um, to have a real crack at it I was involved in um, some other business at the time and um, I've gone look this thing's got some legs, it just needs some more products and it needs me to really go back and look at the marketing of it and that's when we got rid of the whole, the, the um, Urban Boomerang name and rebranded it as Hall mm -hmm. and started. we were at that point making bags out of truck inner tubes, um, which is one of these. Um, so this is a messenger bag, it's kind of one of our products that's really endured Bad for a long yes. time. Yep. Um, and then it was like, all right, now we're going to be making streetwear accessories, what's a name that fits? And, yep. and Hall, if you like, ticked a few boxes, I wanted a, a short um, a short name that had some punch to it that was somewhat industrial. Hall means to carry. Mm. We were making lots of things that carried things, photo albums that carry, that carry photos, bags that carry stuff. Um, and it, I had to be able to buy um, a top level domain name. So hall.com mm. was, was well and truly gone in that, at that point, but hall.com.au, which was initially when I was looking and then mm. someone didn't, um, didn't re-register it, it right. and it just popped up. Well done. And well it wasn't, done. the other thing was it hadn't been trademarked in any of the areas that yep. I thought we were going to play in and potentially would play in the future. So it had everything apart from the URL and then that became a, that, that came up. So I was very happy. I must say, when I first saw the name Hall, it, um, and probably you wouldn't have thought this is way left field, but I thought of the Asterix books and actually building of big structures and things, the notion of hauling stone <laughs> across, you know, to make a pyramid or something like that. It's a really, 
She's like, I didn't, I didn't know the of those books. Work, you know, the whole, the, the, the industrial thing. stuff definitely works. So we do a lot of wordplay now in the in some of our communication, like when we write press releases and and, and use kind of wording and stuff on our website for swing tags about the long haul, short haul, oh. um, all those kind of things. To, and uh, with them having a kind of a you know the, the trucking industry carrying stuff and, and long haul being kind of the air, the airline term but the, one of the tricky things about that name and one of the things I didn't we, you try and do all this analysis of how a name's going to work for you and what it means in these other languages and does it mean something horrible or whatever but the tricky thing is often when I say it one if I'm especially if I'm speaking fast often people think you've said the word whore <laughs> and I've spent a bit of time in Asia and forever and I've got to really slow down say it really slowly because often it comes it rolls out too quickly and so we, especially when I'm teaching I mean simple things like teaching staff to answer the phone sometimes it's like slow down because it can be taken the wrong way you get this deathly science over the phone you know so the things you're it. naming you know can be <laughs> tricky in terms of um, the early days and maybe the early days for you is that transition about four years ago when you've gone from um, a home or, or garage based business yep. to um, you know a proper out there in the world business where you have a lot of risk and you have an ass- some assets at play yep. what was the scariest bit of that transition um, look yeah we, we, we had a workshop for a while there for a while there I had some guys working a couple of guys working for me but I was still doing other things so we, we had a workshop and stuff but it wasn't until I decided that I was going to make a real go at it that I've gone okay what are we going to do here and that way for me the perceived risk kind of rose because it was like I'd really decided it wasn't going to be this thing I'm doing on the side where maybe it works maybe it doesn't but no real effect. No real. Didn't feel like I had any, you know, the skin on the and road all stuff. Kind of comes together, sort of. But then I've gone. I really want to make a play at this, so I took it a lot more seriously then. And I guess that maybe put a little bit of kind of, I guess, self pressure on going. All right, I'm really going to have a go at this, and mm-hmm. you know, it could fail. How did you finance it? What did you do? Credit card bingo. So <laughs> I went. And, we know that one. Yeah, I went. And, <laughs> um, I had a mate of mine that worked at a bank at the time, and he told me that. Oh, I remember asking him some questions about, you know, do banks check if you've applied for other banks credit cards and now they do but they they didn't so i basically went and applied at all the the big kind of big four pillar banks went and applied for credit cards and within within a day i had eighty thousand dollars in credit cards Wow! didn't use them all for a really long time but i knew that i didn't have any bricks and mortar collateral there's no way they're going to be give me a loan i've been living overseas for a long time i had no work record recent work history in australia Mm -hmm. i wasn't going to get anything so the only way was to get my parents to co-sign a loan which i didn't want to do um, so it was credit card bingo. So I basically got all these cards, use one, um, use a small one for my personal expenses and use another one for the business and the other one just sat in the drawer and I you know, paid the 50 or $100 a year to keep them active and mm-hmm. some of the banks rang me and gone, you know, you're not using these cards, we'll shut them down. And I'm like, you know, I'd go and buy $20 worth of stuff and then put keep it back away active. again. So. Mm. And it is harder to do that these days because they do cross-reference and they check. Do. I'm so glad that back in 2000 when we started our stuff, they didn't either. <laughs> it's the classic bootstrapping. You skate because you know you can. And yeah. I, I knew that I wasn't. It was one of those things, once you played your hand, you can't mm. take it off the table. I knew that if I went applying to loans to banks, I, I would basically damage my credit record. So I mm. knew that this was the best way of me to have a crack at it and just mm. schmoozed. Well done. What one piece of advice um, would you give a startup today that you kind of wish you had heard when you got going? Um, listen, get advice from lots of people, but don't listen to everyone. Mm-hmm. So I, I went and I mean, I'd learn a lot from some people I've worked for overseas, some, some kind of some really interesting entrepreneurial types. But one of the guys I worked for said, look, you know, get advice from a really broad group of people, but not everyone's advice counts. And you know, especially the people that love you, their advice doesn't count for anything at all. They'll tell you things about the product. They'll love your product. It's worthless. But even so-called experts, you know, that um, the idea that they might know the industry really well, but if you're doing something that's not quite a perfect fit for what their knowledge base is, they might not know what the new thing is or what how you can navigate off to the left or the tangent that you might be taking it. So take it in, um, be respectful of it, but don't listen to everyone because. Otherwise, new things wouldn't happen. Mm, absolutely, it, and sometimes the truth is somewhere in between all of that advice, yeah, and not out of any one mouth. Totally, I'd agree with that completely. I mean, look at the stuff happening right now with the Facebooks and Twitters of this world. Mm. Those things, people would advise them, gone, that can't work, and yet mm. it, it has, and that's just purely the iPod thing. You know, customers mm. ask for you know more more songs on a on a on a, on a walk, but not necessarily compressing it that way so I think you've got to be a little bit careful of you know where the advice comes from and what what percentage of that you take in I think that's a really good um, point to make for for startup uh, people right now thank you for your time today Scott no problem thanks for having me thank you